of a little bit of going out to um, have a look at what communion is about this morning. I know for some it might be a little bit unusual for, for kids, um, and I can also speak for my two. I often ask them what is communion about before we go up and often we talk about the week. And I think he even was five when I first asked him, and he says, Bread is broken like Jesus' body was broken. And I said, oh, That's good. I said, What about the cup? He said, It's red like the blood. And then he said, Why is it not real life? <laughs> but I couldn't argue with his theology <laughs> for a five year old. I know there's others, and we do often say, If you know Jesus, and I don't want to isolate and we don't want to want to try and educate them a little bit. But at the end of the day, in all reality, if somebody takes communion or not, isn't that important, if whether we know Jesus or not. It's not like there's a department in hell where people go, there's murderers, there's rapists, and then all oh, there's those that took communion that weren't saved. So, Sometimes you just gotta pray for these guys. Well, I'm not praying that they get saved. Amen. Amen. This morning I want to look at Ephesians 5 and verse 3 onwards to verse 7. We start to tackle some issues now which we can't avoid and we can't get away from as we work our way through Ephesians. It's very interesting to me of recently as, as a church we've engaged in prayer, we've come together for more prayer and we've, we're really grappling with prayer, that the amount of people has told me that they are struggling in certain areas, people that feel, you know, maybe it's not right, maybe this, but they're getting uncomfortable, which doesn't surprise me when you consider we're engaging in prayer. All we're doing is, that, is doing what God's asked us to do. So Wednesday night we're going to continue in prayer, if you can come down. Um, but we're working through Ephesians uh, chapter 5, and there's certain stuff in there that we can't avoid, but we'll touch on. And I, will, I don't want to look like I'm pointing at anything, it's just it's the way that it's going. So verse 3, I'm going to read from the NIV, verse 3 of church 5. Among you there must not be an instance of, of sexual immorality, or any kind of impurity or greed. Because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenities, obs foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. I like the way Paul flicks it round every time and brings a positive out of it. For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure or greedy, per uh, greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. I read a commentary recently and it said that even as Christians, we can lose our inheritance. So people who, who, who get involved in certain stuff, um, they say that they can actually lose, they don't lose salvation, but they can lose their inheritance. That's something for you to study and to check out yourself. That's just what a couple of commentators have said. But concerning these verses that I've read, one commentator says this, and I'll put this up front. He says, in the preceding verses, the apostle spoke about sins against our neighbour. In other words, up to this point, Paul's been talking about sins that involve other people. You know, being nice to people, being kind to people, stuff like that. But from here, from verse 3 to 20, he talks mainly about sins against ourselves. Do you know the sins against people, but there's also sins you can do that hurt yourself? It's worth keeping in mind. Not only sexual immorality, but every kind of the same nature, or which leads to, the, to it, is to be avoided. And not only avoided, but not even mentioned among <coughs> believers. The inconsistencies of such sins with the character of Christians as saints, people selected from the world to be consecrated to God is such as should forbid the very mention of them in Christian society. I like that, Christian society. That makes me laugh. But the truth is that there are certain things that should not be mentioned 
So I can't, can't mention them. So, amen. I hope that's been okay for you. <laughs> Paul mentions them. But why does Paul talk this way? Why does Paul come out with certain things that he does and he's leading you through Ephesians and he's talked generally about some sins and he's gone in depth in other sins and now he's talking generally again. But Paul is bringing me that because in the days of the Ephesians, in, in, in Ephesus especially, their culture was anything went. Some of our laws that we have today would seem irrelevant to them. Things that we do these days that we would frown upon was normal in those days. Because of uh, the way society got. If you ever want to check it out, read up on the, the Roman Empire, some of the stuff they got up to. We would class it horrendous. But they did it. So Paul is coming across and telling the Ephesian church especially, and to us today, that you know, there's certain boundaries that God has put in place. And those boundaries are for our good. Because when you sin in certain ways, it's sinned against yourself. It will have an effect on you. Yes, you're saved. Yes, you're forgiven. <coughs> but if you drink poison, it will hurt you. You'll just put heaven quicker. And there's certain things that God has put in place to protect you. It's an old joke, isn't it, about, you know, if you commit uh, adultery and your wife finds out, you will go to heaven sooner. She will kill you. <laughs> Truth being, God has put boundaries for man to live by, but man, men, people, kind of push against the boundaries. They want to break that. Nobody likes to be told what they should and shouldn't do. People don't like it when you say, no, no this far, but no further. People don't like that. It's interesting, the King James Version said it this way, verses 3 and 4. It says, but fornication and all uncleanness and covenous, covenousness, let it be not evenly named among you as fitting as saints. For neither filthiness or foolish talking or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather thanksgiving. Words like fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness that are not words that we use in everyday language nowadays. That's why I read it from the NIV. We all know what sexual immorality is, and um, we know what you know, greediness and impurity is, and you've got to work them through and set them down. But the book of Ephesians as a whole is an amazing book. In the first three chapters, we've already gone through this, but I'll remind you, in the first three chapters, Paul writes about our wealth. What we have in Christ, we are blessed beyond our wildest dreams. We, are, we have got so much going for us. In chapter one, we looked at that we are called by grace, set apart and redeemed. In chapters two, we looked at that fact we've been raised from the dead, not, li not literally, but Spiritually, we've been raised from death unto life. Again in chapter 2, we looked at the fact we've been reconciled to God. An amazing thing that in, often in other religions, they work towards God but never reconciled with Him. As Christians, we are reconciled with Him. In chapter 3, we looked at the fact that Christ's victory over Satan. But then from 4 to 6, Paul now changed it to our war. Not just a theology, not just, in a sense, but the facts behind statements, but now Paul takes it a step further and says, I'm going to show you how you can live in those blessings. I'm going to show you how you can walk. And chapter 4 is mainly about walking in unity. And chapter 4, 17 to 5, 17, it talks about walking in purity. And then from 5, 18 onwards, it talks about walking in harmony. And the last part of uh, chapter 6, 10 onwards, it talks about walking in victory. God wants you and I to walk strong in Him. He wants you to be strong as Christians. He doesn't want you to overcome, uh, not to be overcome by the world, but he wants you to be an overcomer in the world. That's how God is that. He wants you to be there and not a tail. He wants you to live victoriously. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to be strong on the outside and muscle if that helps you, that helps you. But he wants you to be strong as a person. I remember my nan, my nan as she got older, you may have had a nan like her. You know, she was getting frail, but I'll tell you this, when she made her mind up about something, it took a lot to change her mind. She was stubborn. She was very strong in the like wrong way. Especially when you're trying to help and sort things out for her, she'd stand the ground, you know, in the sense of she was sat in a chair. You know, she wouldn't move for anybody. She'd made her mind up that way. She'd made her thought up about somebody that way. It was setting stone to her. As Christians, God wants us to be strong, strong spiritually, strong emotionally, strong on the inside. Yes, strong on the outside, but eventually the outside is going to fade anyway, isn't it? 
You need to be strong as a person. You need to be strong because there will be times when that gets put under pressure. Times when you need to be strong. So Paul's going to talk now about how we can become strong. The message puts verse 3 this way, I like this. He says, do, do not allow love to turn into lust. Setting off a downward slide into sexual promiscuity, filthy practice and bullying greed. I like that phrase because it says, setting off a, down, a downward slide. Everything that starts in our lives and in everybody's life really starts as a seed. It starts as a thought. It starts as an idea. It starts sometimes as a glance. Nobody gets up in the morning and thinks, you know what? I'm going to do something really bad today. In whatever term that is. I'm trying to pick my words carefully because I don't want to upset or offend people. But sometimes, let's put it this way, nobody gets out of bed and thinks I'm going to go do something really indecent. It usually starts with a thought, an idea. Nobody runs off with somebody just getting up one morning because I'm going to run off with them. It starts with a look, a glance, a touch, a conversation. My husband doesn't understand me, or my wife doesn't understand me, that's all. And it develops, it grows in time. That's why we need to nip it in the bud, as it were, and need to get hold of it quicker than we need to. Trying to stop it before it goes anywhere. Some people say, yeah, but Johnny, you take things too far sometimes. I don't think sometimes we take things far enough. <coughs> no one sets out to do bad things. No one sets out to be a bad thing. You know, I'm going to Armley Prison in a few weeks, in a, in a week or so, it's time to visit somebody. But people in there didn't set off that morning they got to commit that crime. But it happened weeks before, developing thoughts in the mind patterns that led him into a path that maybe we couldn't get out of. It's interesting, I uh, listen to a story of the girls that have been caught for drug smuggling in a, another country, and one of them says this, you know, I only did it because I was in debt. Which kind of made me laugh, because it's like she was in debt, so she does something illegal to get herself out of debt. But the reason she was in debt is because, you know, she'd spent everything on stuff she shouldn't have been spending it on in the first place. But it's a cycle, she never meant to get there, but that's the path she chose, and eventually got there. So that's why Paul said, we shouldn't be an int of it. We shouldn't, it's not a case of doing it, it shouldn't even be talked about or an int of it. Many people that are in, are in debt didn't get into debt overnight. I mean, David will talk to you about it if you really want to know, but they didn't just suddenly walk into a bank, take out a loan, go, oh, I'm in debt. Now, some people might go bankrupt, some people might go. But a lot of people are in major debt getting to it because they, they get into debt because they want something, they're covering themselves with something, or you know, they're not spending what they should do on the right things, or they're not budgeting properly. There's lots of reasons, and you can't blame everybody. But then sometimes they get themselves, they go take another loan to pay off a loan, and get a credit card to pay off another credit card, and it becomes a cycle to the point where it's out of control. And then they may think it didn't happen overnight, and it can't be solved overnight. It's also, you know, people who are overweight, and I, I can't look at people in case that's you. Um, people of weight, it took time to get into that place of being overweight. And it will take time to lose that weight as well. It doesn't happen overnight. But sometimes we think on the two sides of this, on one you got, it'll never happen to me syndrome, and then it does. And then on the opposite side of it, they go, well if it happens, I'll pray about it and God will deal with it. You know, if it takes you 10 years to get into a situation, why do we expect God to do that and get us out of that situation? Yes, God does do miracles. God does do amazing things. Aunt Tim is an amazing person. This is my brother, but God did an amazing thing in his life. He detoxed him instantly. But that means Tim can't equate with people now who are struggling through a detox. Because God did it for him. There's a reason why God did that. But Paul tells us there must not be even an int, a little bit. In the Old Testament, we read a lot about yeast. Now, God doesn't have a problem with yeast. That's the bacteria stuff which we bread to make it low so we get nice fluffy bread. It hasn't got a problem with that, but it uses it often as an analogy of the fact that yeast works its way in to the whole bread. And sometimes little things can creep into our lives that work through. Because at the end of the day, we're all adults, nearly, we're all adults, and let's be honest, sometimes we do things and we know it's not right, but we get away with it. We don't get home suddenly after pinching something, I'll say that because I'm assuming nobody does, pinching a little bit from somewhere, and there's an angel on the door going, oh, 
he's really shown the man. Because we haven't got a dad or a big brother syndrome coming over going, what are you doing? We think we've got away with it. But it actually does have an effect on us. Even if it's only a little effect. We need to nip things in the bud and take every thought captive the Bible says. It's like viruses on your body. You know, as winter approaches, we all say we get viruses. You know, there's a virus going around, there's this going around, there's that going around. We've got this bug, have we got that bug? But it's interesting that the people who often get them are people that are not so strong. And I don't mean just muscle wise. If you eat well, keep fit, walk, exercise, or whatever, and sleep well, you don't often get the viruses and bugs that go around. But if you don't eat well, you don't keep fit or don't exercise, and your sleep patterns are erratic, or you oversleep or whatever, you're often more prone to them. It's because physically your body can't cope with the virus when it attacks you. But if you eat well and you keep fit and you sleep well, when that virus attacks you, your body's already engaged and it can attack it. Joe and I, we've, um, we've been to invite to lots of barbecues over the years and we went to one yesterday. And it's quite amusing because everybody watching me, my brother thinks I'm rather funny. Because we'll come, we'll enjoy ourselves, but as soon as everything starts getting silly, you know, the beer's been out a while, things are getting silly, I'll tell you, Joe, it's time to go. My brother smiles to knows what we're doing, you know, we're going, we've had fun, we've all seen everything's okay, but we're going. Because I don't want an end to that, it's not that I've got a problem with drinking, but I don't want my kids to see what's going on. And I don't want things affecting my life. When the joking starts, when the rudity starts, when things start creeping in, I just think sometimes I just pull my family out of there, I leave it. There's times where I need to stand my ground in that. And when that comes, because I've pulled away and it's not affecting me, I don't get drawn in so easy. And that's what Paul said, that there shouldn't be an end of it, because he wants us to be... So when there comes a point where you need to go into places to talk with people, witness, or stand with people, it's not a, it's not a problem to you. See, I've got a friend, and he says to me, Johnny, I think we should go witnessing in pubs. And I said to him, I'll be honest with you, I won't take you into a pub. He says, why not? I said, you used to have a drink problem. He said, yeah, but that used to be. And I goes, I'm not taking you into a pub. It's never bothered me, so I can go in. But I'd never take him in with me. Even though he said we need to get in there, it's never been a problem. If we allow little things to come into our life, they're the little things that can sometimes grow into bigger things that can knock us on our backs. The good news is that even if we do get knocked down by things, we've got a God who loves and cares for us, who lifts us back up. And as soon as we turn to him, you know, it will be it's like the prodigal father there just waiting for us to come, the prodigal son's father, waiting for us to come home. But Paul's talking to us because he wants us to live lives that are strong, live lives that can change other people's lives, lives that are worthy of the walk, worthy of the call that we're being called to. And let's face it, if you've ever come across um, other people, some, I remember I went on holiday years and years ago, and uh, one of the lads were hung out of the minibus window, we were going to the Alps, being sick because he had too much to drink. And I left it, I'm thinking, you know, I'm sharing a tent with this lad. You know, it's going to be alright. By the time we got there, I sit down, once we got to the campsite, I'm reading my Bible. And this lad, this boy said to me, I'm a Christian as well. And I turned around to see the lad who had his head out of the window being sick. And I'm thinking, oh dear. I know it's not about living you know, white than white lives and point of a finger, but sometimes we need to be careful what we do because often non-Christians are watching us more than we're watching ourselves sometimes. But always ready to pick fault with you. Always ready to, to pull. You know, you look at somebody for more than a split second and if you've got some, oh, you're looking at her, I am just looking. And I want you to look, oh, you know. And sometimes we're going to denial and stuff, but we've got to be careful that we don't let things take root, don't let that seed plant down. Sometimes our attitude is, it's okay, it won't happen to me. That's a dangerous place to be. It's not saying okay, you need to safeguard yourself. The reason why drink don't bother me is because years ago I put that to bed. Now you're all curious to know if I drink or not, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but I will say I put it to bed. It's never been a problem. Drugs have never been a problem. Primarily because I wanted to keep fit, because I wanted to win army. 
So I never bothered with drink and drugs that much at all. In fact, drugs not at all. Just keep yourself fit. It says this, Let no one deceive you by empty words. For because of such things, God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. It's interesting that a lot of what Paul would talk about throughout Ephesians and Galatians, Colossians, the world would have a problem with it. See, the world doesn't have a problem with what we would call sexual immorality. It doesn't have a problem with it. It says, get on, you know, get on with it, do it. Does it matter? Does it hurt anybody? As long as everybody's consenting, does it hurt it? I heard a preacher say recently, you know, if everybody's stuck to just getting married and then sleeping with their wives or husbands and leaving it at that, AIDS would be really on the, it'd be out within a generation. Sexual diseases, uh, if we can call it that, that's not the political correctness word for it, but they'd be non-existent. Unwanted pregnancies, abortion would go down. And yet they say it's normal. The Bible says it's not normal. It's interesting that man calls immorality normal in most circles, and yet in some circles they would call it sickness. Some people will take it to extremes. God would call it a sin. Men would condone it and even celebrate it. It's interesting, a city had a march for Jesus, and several thousand people turned up for this march for Jesus. Short time later, they had a pride <coughs> march. Tens of thousands turned up. Sometimes men condone and celebrate sexual immorality. Men's answer to these problems is psychology. God's problem, God's answer to these is regeneration. They would say, sit on a couch and talk about it. God would say, you need to change the inside. Once the heart's changed, everything else changes. If the heart's not, not changed, nothing changes. They may stop things for a while, they may change their attitudes, but only the inside can change a person on the outside, not the other way around. Whatever you wear and put a, you know, whatever you do on the outside will not change who you are on the inside. God changes who you are on the inside. The human heart, actually, the Bible says, is incurable and it must be replaced. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Your heart, actually, is neither good or bad. But what you put into it will determine what grows out of it. If you put forgiveness in there, forgiveness will come out. But if you put unforgiveness into it, unforgiveness will come out. That's why Paul talks a lot about don't let there be an end to it. Because once it takes an hold in your life, it will develop. Once things start to grow, it takes, it takes a while for them to get out. And sometimes you've got to damage things around to pull out the roots of problems. And I'm trying to encourage you guys. <laughs> you know? Serious stuff. Therefore, do not partner with them. We don't have to do what the world does. This is an amazing thing. The world will tell you what you ought to do. You do not have to do it. It's interesting that media, films, music, is often portrayed a lot of what Paul said is wrong. They portray it as being right. Even on, on, on the way over this morning, a song came on. And it was basically portraying a promiscuous life. It's everywhere. And I was, you know, listening to the song because I was what we were going to say. And then Hope starts singing it, as soon as Hope starts singing it, Joe turned it over, turned it off. It was suddenly clicked. But they're all, it's all creeping through. I remember working as a scaffolder many years ago, there was me and my friend, and my mate were there with me, and he's carrying some gear, and I'm up on the scaffold, and he's down, I'm looking at him, and there's two girls talking to him. So I come down, and he says, no, he said, but I nearly run up the scaffold, and I said, why, what's up? He said they start coming up and singing a Spice Girls song, when two become one. And one of these girls obviously didn't know what she was saying, but she said to him, would you like to become one with me? And she was singing it. Now my mate knew exactly what that meant. Obviously she didn't, but it was interesting. He was thinking, I need to get out of here. I do not blame any victim for leading anybody on, by the way. I'm just, that's just a story from the past. 
but no victim, uh, you no, know, nobody's got the right to violate somebody saying they led me on. But there's interest that the world talks a lot about facts, facts, facts. Everything should be about facts. I'll tell you some facts. It's interesting that over the last uh, 20 years, sex education has got earlier and earlier in schools, and they keep saying to us, "We need to educate and educate." It's amazing that there's that much education being put on this subject. It's unbelievable. But all that seems to happen is the age seems to get lower and lower. As they educate and lower, it seems to get lower and pregnancy rates. That's just a thought. But they often say, you know, we need, we need facts. And, but I say, you know, facts are not always truth. Sometimes there's a difference. See, but, you know, we can say that I feel weak. I feel poor. That's a fact. You may be weak. You may be poor. But the truth is according to the word of God. That let the, the, the weak say I'm strong. And let the poor say I'm rich. It doesn't matter how much money you've got in your pocket, you are rich if you're a Christian. You have got blessings beyond blessings. And if you want something, start honouring God and asking God for it. Start believing and honouring what God gives you. And then God, it, it creates a cycle. If you feel weak, do the wise thing. Go to bed on time, you know, sleep a little bit longer, eat well, healthy. And I'm not a doctor, this is common sense stuff. I watch him that embarrassing body, it's not that I get into, I'm flicking through it, I'm a guy, and he was 30 odd stone, and uh, the doctor said, oh, you know, realistically, you need to consider losing weight. And he said, oh, are you to tell me I need to lose weight? And he says, I'm not telling you, I'm just saying that results of your illness are because of your weight. And he said, but you're having a go at me. And he was like, no, I'm not. The fact's what he was overweight, but he couldn't handle the truth, but he needed to do something about it. As Christians, sometimes we can feel weak, but we need to stand on the truth of God that says, I am rich. Sorry, I am strong. If you're poor, you need to believe that you are rich. It doesn't matter about your bank account, it matters who you are on the inside. That's why Paul says to us, don't let them be in it, because you don't want any, anything to creep into your life. In a dam, you know, if you watch a dam, buses filled and things like that, a little crack is all it takes to bring things down. In our lives, sometimes it can just be a little crack. So that's why we need to be aware of things and we need to look at things. You may say, when I became a Christian, nothing changed. That might be the fact. On the outside, nothing changed. But on the inside, you became a new creation in Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's who you are. You are now a new creation. That's the truth. The fact is, you've still got the same coloured eyes and the same hair cut. But on the inside, you've become a new creation. Let's have a look at Joshua, chapter 6. It says this. This is talking about the difference between facts and truth. Chapter 6, it says this. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of Israelites. No one went in and no one came. Nobody went out and nobody came in. That's a fact, okay? That city was there. It was doing that. It was locked up. This was the truth for that the Lord says to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. The truth was, it was shut up, locked up, nobody came in or out. But the truth was, so that the fact was, it was shut up. The truth was, God had given it to Joshua. Amen. And sometimes we've got, to, we've got to make the difference between truth and fact. Sometimes we dwell on facts too much. It will never happen to me, it's a fact. Oh, oh no. But the truth is it can do. And that's why we need to stand on the word of God. You know, you might say the fact might be, but I can't go on anymore in these circumstances, in these situations. That might be a fact, that might be true. Uh, it might be a, a real fact. But the truth is that we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. You may want to give up, but the truth is you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. And furthermore, it says this, I am more than a conqueror through him who loves us. So not only is God giving you the strength to overcome situations, he's making you more than a conqueror. I like that because to be a conqueror means you've got to have overcome something and you've got to have the strength to overcome it in the first place. So whatever situation or fact that's in your life right now, you can overcome it, you can conquer it, through the, through the strength that Christ gives you. Because the strength that Christ gives you doesn't rely on your physical strength. It relies on you having a bit of guts and a backbone and stand up and say, I'm drawing a line in this. That's why one of the commandments that occurs all the way through the Bible is do not fear. Fear not. 
Why does he say it so often? Because we naturally fear. The facts are we have fear, but the truth is we should fear not. Stand up, face it, and walk on. You may say to me this morning, but Johnny, the fact is I'm a nobody. And we all can be there, but the truth is you are God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works. That's the truth. You may consider yourself a nobody, and the fact is you may be a nobody. I don't think there's no nobodies here. But the truth is, you are God's workmanship. And what God starts, he finishes in every one of our lives. So you're not a nobody. You may feel like a nobody, but you are not a nobody. You might say, Johnny, but I'm alone. The fact is, I'm on my own. There's many people are on their own. Let me remind you what 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says. It says, you are chosen. You know, you could be in a crowd of people, don't when you're chosen. You may be on your own, but the truth is, you are chosen this morning. You may say, Johnny, the fact is, I have sinned. The truth is that we are forgiven of all our sins, according to Ephesians 1 7, and that we are also redeemed from the curse of sin, according to Deuteronomy 28, and that sin no longer has power over us. That's the truth. The fact is, you have sinned, but the truth is, Sin has no power over your life. That's an interesting one. I listened to a, a preacher and he said, you know, you know, sin is worse for a Christian than it is for a non-Christian. And I got some, ooh. He said, I'll tell you why. He said, because a Christian chooses to sin. Because sin has no power over their life. But the truth also is that all our sins are forgiven. We're done away with, gone away with. So if you do sin, you, we know of a God that we can come to and repent and accept that forgiveness that we've already been forgiven. You may say to me, Johnny, I'm sick. The fact is you may be sick, but the truth is by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5, 1 Peter 2, 24. You may be sick this morning. The doctor may say to you, you are sick. But the truth is, in Christ, our healings have already taken place. We've just got to tap into them and trust God. You might say, John, the fact is that I'm not loved. The great news is, and the truth is, that we are greatly loved by God. Romans 1, Ephesians 2, Colossians 3, 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, it all talks about the love of God. So facts and truth are completely different. This morning, I don't know where your situation is, where you've come from, what's going on in your life. I don't know if there's cracks or if you're solid. I don't know if you're strong or weak on the inside. But I can say this, if you are weak on the inside, you need to start saying, I'm strong. Yes. It's not, you need to start believing that you are strong because it's not by might, not by power, by my spirit, says the Lord. And then it goes on to tell that Jerusalem went on to do the work. But the Spirit of God in you can overcome anything that this world can throw at you. That's why it's amazing that as we engage in prayer, like we have been doing, suddenly it's unsettling people. It's not themselves. It's somebody whispering facts into them. You know, you are tired. You don't go to prayer meeting. You don't need to go. Does it really matter? It's interesting that when you're a strong Christian, you're in your word all the time. You're in prayer all the time. For as things slip into your life, as you start to become weak as a Christian, your prayer life kind of changes. Your reading changes. Your worship changes. Your acceptance of the word changes. But you don't have to stay there. Don't settle for second best. Set, settle for the best. Become the person you are called to be. Be strong in Jesus. When we are in Christ, we've got some amazing things going on for us. And we need to tap into that. This is the truth. That we can all press on for the goal and win the prize which God has got for us in Christ as he calls us upwards. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, of, of spirit of fear but of power, love and a sound mind. And it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That's truth that we need to get hold of. The fact is, you may feel like you're on the floor and you're nearly dying, but the truth is, it's not I who lives, it's Christ that lives in me. You can smile at that and you can get excited. I know it's been an hard sermon and they're pointing out certain stuff, but the truth is that it's not Christ who, it's not me that lives, it's Christ who lives in me. That's Galatians 2.20. 
Christ is doing some amazing things in all of us. And just because you're not seeing and worked out on the outside, it doesn't mean they're not happening on the inside. You need to realise that the seeds that have been planted in your heart, some of them have been there for years, and God's removing them one by one. And you, as you read the Word of God, as you get into prayer and worship, new seeds have been entered into that soil which are developing. But a flower doesn't grow overnight. You need to start putting things into your life now that it may reap in a time to come. Oh, asked me recently, why are you blessed, Dad? I said, I am. She was, but why? In the context of giving. I said, because many years ago I learned to give. And I'm reaping the seeds I sowed then. And we talked about it. So she said, I need to start sowing some seeds and giving. So that when I get to university and need the money, God will give that to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But you need to sow things into your life that are going to develop over time and come out. We sometimes think, well, I've prayed once, why did that happen? I've read it once, why is it not? Because we need to start believing it and start trusting it. We need to start pressing on to the goal that God's got for us and start winning those prizes instead of settling for the second best. When you go, when you push forward to win the prize, it's not always easy. Even though Usain Bolt runs past that finishing line with metres between him and the second person looking like it's easy, the fact is that the first 80 metres he's run for his life. And the last 20 metres he slows down to take it a bit easier. But as he gets older, but the younger ones want to come through, he'll have to start really going for it. And as Christians, we've got to keep on keeping on. We've got to keep pushing forward. We've got to keep... But the main thing, the main thing, and start keeping the word in your life. The way you keep strong in Jesus is to keep the word in your life. If you don't put the word in, I wonder why you get hungry. If you don't eat, I mean, if you want a, a, a note on this, this week to come, we're going to do some concrete in, downstairs in the cellar. So come along. But what I want you to do before you come along is don't eat anything or drink anything for two days before. And let's see how strong you can be. You'll never do it. It'll kill you. Five minutes, you'll be, be out of it. But if you, if you have a good meal the night before, you'll be strong. Good sleep the night, night before, you'll be strong. So as Christians, we need to keep under the word. We need to get into the word. We need to keep our prayer lives strong. That's why Paul says to us, I'm trying to find where we are. That we need to live a life, walk in purity, walk in harmony, and then we can live in victory. We'll get into victory later on. There's a Psalmic Bible that I think is really amazing. When you understand who you are in Christ, when you understand how much you've got going for yourself in God, when you see the blessings that God's poured out for you, when you see and understand what God's really done for you, when we look at the communion, when you look, sing some of these songs, we look at how blessed we really are. Sometimes we struggle to say, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And yet that should be something that comes out of us naturally. If you really want to scare somebody, if they say, how are you? Instead of saying, I'm not bad, thank you. You say, I'm blessed. It kind of throws them back. What do you mean I'm blessed? I'm blessed. And I don't tell them anything else then. What do you mean you're blessed? I'm not telling you. I'm just blessed. And it really confuses them because it's not natural. The natural answer is not bad. What's that really mean? Not bad. Does it mean I wish I was bad, but I'm not? <laughs> not bad. No. The, out the fact is the outside's failing. The truth is the inside's alive. <clears throat> and on an Edward course with Jesus. Outside we can't take much sometimes. On the inside we should stand strong. Some of you are a lot stronger on the inside than you are on the outside. Most of us are, really. But some of you are a lot stronger than you think. The problem is you give up too quick. And do you know how I know it? You should see that some mums who are very timid and quiet don't say boo to anybody until somebody has to go their kids. And suddenly it's monster <laughs> rise. It's not really a monster, it's them. The real them on the inside. Whoa. Because they've been so used to being told you're nothing, you're nobody, quiet down, shut up. Like it's only when somebody pushes the kids that they suddenly rise up and become the person they really are. It's that shining through. 
We should be like that all the time. Not in an aggressive sense, but in a strong sense. All of us. Psalm 103, an amazing um, chapter in the Bible, but the first five verses said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and in my uttermost, with, sorry, and with all that is in me, bless the holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities, heals all our diseases, who redeems my life from a pit, and has crowned me with, satis with um, steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth will be renewed like eagles. This is Old Testament. Okay. This is pre-Christ. This is before Jesus came. How much more have we got? We get excited of that verse. We've got so much more going for us. We can say this and we can live by this. Bless the Lord, all my son. And not forget his benefits. You talk to somebody who's turned away from Jesus and tell them the good things about Jesus. But look at you, have gone out. Because they've forgotten the benefits. And the psalmist writes them. Who has forgiven all our iniquities. He's forgiven our sins. Who heals our sicknesses. Who redeems our life. Basically, he's forgiven us. He's healed us. And we're going to heaven. And he's crowned us with love and mercy. And he gives us good things. And he renews our strength. You're thinking, wow, I can't feel that strong anymore. Outside, inside, is renewing your strength. You are strong on the inside. Live like strong Christians that you are. Start being the person you are. Stand tall. The outside's fake, and that's a fact. But inside, the truth is, you are more than a conqueror. You are mighty on the inside. You are strong on the inside. You don't have to put up things. Now, you need to be polite. and you need to be gracious and forgiving. And so but you don't have to roll over every time somebody pushes you and play dead. You can be strong on the inside. If you don't like something, say you don't like it. Don't mumble about it. Now you're going to tell me stuff now. But the truth is, start being the person. I'd rather people be honest. And not say something. I'll, and that's me. I try to be honest with people. I like people to be honest with me. But if you don't like something, say it. If you like it, thank God for it. Give people encouragement. Give people praise. But if you don't like something, say something. Deal with it. Nip it in the bud. Don't let it become a problem. The truth is people will get up your nose. Or antagonise you. Don't be posh word. The fact is, so the truth is, you don't have to put up with it. You can deal with it. In Jesus. I don't mean go around pointing your finger at people, but we shouldn't forget that our primary thing is to serve Jesus, to go for the call of God that's on our life, and to bless the Lord, all oh my soul, with, and not forget anything He's done for us. That's something to get excited about. I think we need to go and read that. And if I were a teacher now, I'd send you out to read it a hundred times, because some of you look like you need it. Bless the Lord, all oh my soul. <laughs> We're going to sing a song, and in it it says 10,000 reasons. We've got millions of reasons. And I'll say this, that when we get to heaven, I don't know if we'll have enough time in eternity to thank him for everything that he's actually done for us. And eternity is a long time. Well, we're here for 105 years, or 70 in some cases. I keep telling John we're only until 105. Which is why 105, because I don't know. <laughs> I just like 105. But I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be walking. And I'm not going to die when I preach. That's what I said to her. I'm going to stand up one day and preach and die. If Smith Ruggles can do that sort of thing, you know, he didn't quite do it that way, but that's what I want. Go out with your boots on. Strong on the inside. It really amazes me. If you want to know about Christians that are strong, on the inside. The lady she will call Miss Sambler over at Wakefield, she was about this big. She started off here, but over here she just got smaller and smaller. <laughs> you, I used to go visit her every now and then, and she, wanted, she didn't have a clue who I was, she didn't have to, just somebody I knew. She didn't know what family was, she didn't know what date was, she didn't know about anything. And I said to her, Tell me about Jesus. And this woman who couldn't even remember her last name sometimes tell me about Jesus for 20 minutes and her spirit would come alive inside her the body was fading the mind was going but her spirit on the inside soared because that's who she really was and she used to say when I get to heaven we can talk more about these things 
And she used to end with that and often fade away. Looking forward to that day when, in heaven, we'll talk more about these things. So be strong in the Lord. Be strong and courageous. The Bible tells that all the way through. But let's sing this song. Reminds us of this Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and in and all that is in me, me bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not His benefits.